All right, welcome back to the Presidio Perspective. Dustin Timbrook in the studio with Jeff Anderson and Sierra on the ones and twos. Man, we had quite a week, and uh, well, we're here to talk to you about it and what's going on, recession fears, bear markets. They're never fun, but lots of lessons to be learned and a playbook for the future. So let's get this episode going. Jeff, let's get right to it, man. How you doing, first of all? Let's not get right to it. How are you? <laughs> you hanging in there? We're hanging week? in there. Good, yeah. good. Yeah, we, we have to. We are, we are climbing that wall of worry so our listeners and clients don't have to, but we're here to give our perspective on what's going on. So what happened this week? A lot happened. Let's talk about it. Well, it started Monday. <laughs> yeah. Uh, where all of a sudden it was leaked to the, to the press that the Fed was going to go to 75 basis points <clears throat> in their rate hike decision on Wednesday, and which, you know, I've been in this business for 22 years, which I'm not sure if that's long or short, but it feels long. Um, the 10-year Treasury yield immediately went up 25 basis points. I mean, I don't think I remember seeing that happen before. Yeah. It was, it was shocking. Yeah. Um, but <clears throat> what happened the week before? CPI data. We are talking about that last week. Remember... Um, everybody, all the economists with their crystal balls, which seemed to be cracked. Inflation was peaking. Inflation it's was start peaking. Down. We're going to get a CPI print of 8.1. Uh, we had peaked at 8.6, we thought, or what was it? Eight, I'm sorry, 8.3 in March. And it came in March. at 8.6. Yeah, and we thought, okay, it was 8.3, eight then it was 8.2. They thought 8.1, okay, this is going to be good. And we said, okay, well, we get an 8.1 print or better. Maybe investors start to take pause and say, okay, wait, maybe the worst is over. And lo and behold, 8.6 shows up. Okay. And the market goes into an upheaval. And Monday comes along, and there's a leak that rates are going even higher, or the uh, interest rate policy is, is going to be more. I mean, that hasn't been reported that there's a leak. So we should also tell we, people we, we can read the tea leaves. Yeah. But, yeah. you know. A move on the 10 year of 25 basis points at the end of the day suggests that somebody, it was fully priced in, 100% priced in on Monday is what we're saying, that instead right. of 50 basis points, we're going to get 75. I mean, it wasn't a portion of it. It was spot on, that right. extra 25 basis points. Immediately. And yeah. so you're saying, well, that, you know, that's just too coincidental. It's too coincidental. Yeah. I don't want to get into conspiracy theories, but it's been done before. Yep, absolutely. Um, so we've, we've talked about it It doesn't before. matter. I mean, that's just what happened. And then here we go. We got 75 basis points on Wednesday. And then signaling possibly 75 next a, month. A lot of people don't understand what that meant because um, the markets were – it was topsy-turvy like we're experiencing in this bear market is mm -hmm. highly volatile. Right. Um, and which is why investors are best to just hang on and um, not start messing with things during these volatile periods because the information changes so quickly. Um, you really can get just – caught on the wrong side of something right right and so it's really important to remain long term and keep your long term focus which we want to absolutely end on in this podcast today definitely but so essentially we we know we have inflation nobody has to read a report everyone now knows that there's inflation right they are there at the gas pump they're there at the food prices they're there at the you know, Airbnb rate potentially. I mean, whatever you're spending your money on, I mean, it's it's astounding. Yeah. I'm surprised about how quickly these restaurants have reprinted some of their, their menus. menus, like overnight. I'm right. like, oh, that's an extra four dollars on this ten dollar sandwich. It's all of a sudden fourteen ninety nine for a sandwich. Or the price stays the same and the sandwich is half the size. And I've seen that a lot, yeah. right? And that's what do they call that type of inflation? Oh, There's I a word know. for it. It'll yeah. come to us right when we conclude the episode. <laughs> um, but uh, um. yeah, exactly. And so, so people know, though. My point is people know that there's inflation, and they know that we have to get it under control. And so one of the ways to do that is the Fed has to tighten monetary policy to try to slow things down. Right. Um, you know, get some money out of the system because, you know, what is inflation? Too much money ta chasing too few goods. Right. So supply and demand. Where's the demand come from? People have lots of money. And then now we have a supply shortage. So prices are rising. Right. So what can the Fed do? You know, they can't go drill for oil. They can't go open up refineries. Right. They can't 
you know, manufacture more bread or grow more wheat. But what they can do is try to dampen down the demand. And they do that by twofold. One, increasing the borrowing costs on the federal funds rate, right, on the short end of the curve. And then also, you know, managing the long duration bonds on the, the long end of the curve. Yeah. Right? <coughs> Whether buying or selling bonds. With, with their $9 trillion in, in assets sitting on their balance sheet, which they're trying to. Right. So they're going to start selling, which, you know, um, would make the yields go up. Right. right? So, so borrowing costs go up. Interest rates go up. Um, and so people, I think, are, are feeling it. And so we're pulling back on spending, right, when that starts to happen. And that's what needs to happen for inflation to come in, in rain. Right. Um, so anyway, so, I, so okay, last meeting, Powell said 50 next, you know, in, in June we're going to do 50. 75 is not even on the table. Right. Well, you know, one of the things that I think people digested is they're – if there was any question whether they were behind the curve or not, I think we just got our answer. Because for 75 not to be on the table, then you had to have been thinking something else was going to happen come June. Right. So you were wrong. Right. And so I think it took the market a day to digest that. The first thing is, okay, well, we now have the new information. Do we have the right people at the Fed and the chair that are going to make the tough decision that needs to happen? And do they perceive the economy to be strong enough to withstand it? And we've seen this happen before in your career and mine, is that you know when the Fed is more accommodative sometimes, say they only raise 50 instead of 75, you say, well, isn't that good? They're more accommodative, isn't that good for markets? No, it's a sign that the markets are not healthy, the economy's not healthy and can't withstand it. And that's right. what we've seen in sell-offs. I would, I would I bet it would have been a pretty brutal sell-off on Wednesday if they only had done 50. Yeah. So 75, the market says, okay, great. The Fed is committed to reining in inflation, which they want to see, and the market's strong enough to withstand a 75. Yep. Okay, this is good. Next day, what happens? <laughs> Reversed all those gains. And, and, and then some. And then some, and uh, which brings me to, I want to show this. We're going to put it up on the, on the podcast. I don't know if you can hear me, but let me grab it. So this was Monday, though, but I think it really sums things up. It was I took a screenshot of Bloomberg.com, and let me just read a few titles. Yeah. Got a picture of Biden walking with his head down in a somber mood. God knows what he was doing, but it, it fits the profile of this front page. U.S. recession odds hit 72% threatening Biden presidency. Consumer spending is running out of steam and the market isn't ready for it. U.S. mortgage rates surged to 5.78 in biggest jump since 1987. Tesla stock has more than Twitter weighing on it. Revlon files bankruptcy. Private equity faces crisis over value, or uh, a crisis of value over inflated prices. I mean, there's just nothing good there. And usually, when you see a chart, you know, see a chart upward sloping, it look, you know, that's usually a good sign. No, that's mortgage rates, mm -hmm. and it's going parabolic, which is having its effect on on housing. But we, we've talked about this before. We're going to get into it. But there's an emotional component, right? It, the economy. It's we like to apply math to the economy. We like to treat it as a science, a hard science. It isn't a hard science. If you go to bed at night. Water is made of two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. You wake up in the morning, you're in a bad mood, it's still two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen, right? Your feeling on the economy could change and you could dial back spending. You dial back spending, economic activity decreases, they re, um, increases the likelihood of a slowdown in a recession. I mean, it's it equally in short periods of time equally emotional we can talk we've talked about this before you can talk yourself into a recession you yeah. really can now if things are going really well and just a, a, a group of people who are just pessimistic by nature they're not going to talk us into a recession but there are things that are happening that are you know inflation's running high we're probably in the late stages of this cycle and that's a natural phenomenon the peaks and troughs of a business cycle so here we are well we had the negative gdp growth in the first quarter right and so here we are in the second quarter. So where are we kind of lining up? What are, what are the estimates? You know, analysts Flat, like, zero. I mean, that's a pretty tight margin to whether we're in a recession or not. Yeah, and we're now talking 
what, 2021, I think we had 7 or 8% GDP growth. But again, that's inflation is a, is a component of that. But now they're talking 2 3%. So we're back to the low growth GDP environment we've been in. Which is a real decline of depending on what inflation finishes off at the year. I right. mean, if we grow by 3 and annualized inflation this year is 6, I mean, we had a, a shrinking economy by a real rate of 3%. Right. And that might not be booked as a recession, right? Right. Uh, mathematically or whatever that that is but it's the same thing right right? we are not growing people have less money wages you know um, asset prices etc so you know they're they're gonna feel the effects of a recession even if it's not a nominal recession but a real recession yeah absolutely and these uh, types of headlines they don't help I mean looking at these headlines you're right I mean it's just which is such the news in general right I mean it's I don't know if today's paper or it's going to be very much different right it's that right. wall of worry that we always talk about but i think a lot of the listeners could even just think about uh yeah what do they think about on the on the drive home or you know as they're making their plans for the summer or where to go out and eat or whether to remodel the kitchen i mean you can tell even if you know it hasn't permeated to like i'm not gonna i'm not i'm gonna carpool right right but you might have thought about it for the first time. Right. <laughs> you might have thought about maybe I'm just going to work from home and save the gas. Right. And, I mean, even just thinking about that, people can tell, yeah, that's going to permeate its way into the economy. And so when we say talk ourselves into a recession, if you're fearful, people freeze. If businesses are fearful, they don't hire, right? Uh, spending kind of pulls back. Earnings are less. People are holding on to cash. There's less investment into the future. And that's the kind of wall of worry that we'll really have a, a recession. Right. Which overall is just part of an economic cycle and is actually a really healthy thing for economies to go through um, because what's on the other side of that is a lot of phenomenal investment and growth and opportunity. Um, and they're never fun going into the recession. I mean, especially those who are in the workforce. You know, if you're retired, yeah, I'm sad when I see that my stock portfolio has gone down in value or Zillow says my home isn't worth as much or not going up as much. But, you know, I likely have my long-term debt put in place. Inflation's making that worth less, you know, over time. I, even if my real returns aren't that big, my nominal growth of my assets are, are going higher. Um, you know, and so, however, if we're working, right, and you're trying to build those assets, it could be really challenging. People could lose their jobs. People can get cuts in salary or, you know, go to the gig economy. And all those people are, are making less money. I mean, all those Uber drivers, Lyft drivers, you know. I mean, I, I for one, you know, was a big fan of Uber Eats because I was working. And now I'm, now I'm going to go pick up my burrito if I want to, yeah. right? I mean, there's just that pullback that yeah. you do. <clears throat> and it's an uh, interesting point you made about – um, uh, fixed debt. You basically talking about mortgages, right? And not to say that inflation is great, there, but they're they're somewhat. I mean, how long have we been pounding that drum? You know, yeah. for quite some time. I mean, certainly over the last decade that Presidio has been around, we've been educating people on um, the fact that money in the future is worth less, right? And the risk of paying down the mortgage, and and you know what that real return is for you over time and so you know just imagine those people who are sitting on a sub three percent interest rate um locked in for 30 years and so when they see that this 5.78 mortgage you know went over six i think this week what i saw Mm -hmm. um you know it's not affecting them as much that's a good segue into housing and banks why don't we get into that sure so um because that's another topic that's probably front and center um so where are we with a 30-year mortgage we're what, almost at six percent 5.8 okay 2.93 a year ago it's quite a move that's yeah almost double home sales slowing dramatically for a couple of reasons one obviously a jump in rates makes the affordability less so and um seen the data that housing affordability actually with the jump in rates has actually gone much lower so it's becoming even more uh, hard to own a home. But <clears throat> if you are considering trading up for a home or relocating, you're probably not going to do it. You're locked into a three, three and a half percent mortgage. 
why are you going to move? You don't have to move. You've got equity. You're locked in at a good rate. So maybe you're not going to, which adds to the housing shortage. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> back in 08, back in 05, 04, or sorry, 04, 05, 06, the home builders going crazy, land banking, everything, buying tons of land with the idea that we're just going to build, build, build. And we overbuilt, mm-hmm. and we know the problem with that. Shoddy underwriting and just too much inventory. That's not the case right now. So, yeah, interest rates are higher, but historically they're still low. Uh, people probably don't want to hear that, but they still are relatively low. Um, but but home prices are relatively crazy high from they, a long-term perspective, too. They are. but Maybe not crazy high, but high. But high. But if you're considering buying a home and you're thinking, okay, well, interest rates are higher and I wish they were lower, it's kind of there's a, an emotional bias to anchoring to something that may not come back. We may not see 3% mortgage rates, and they may continue to go higher. Um, so what ends up happening? Inflation's going higher. Prices are going higher. We talked about it. Rents lag. So if I buy a house, maybe it's a little bit more expensive for me, but I lock in a rate. I'm paying that same fixed rate for 30 years, but my rent keeps going up. Mm-hmm. So th- there's there's a – at some point, people are going to realize, I don't want to keep paying these CPI bumps on my rent. Right. I'm just going to go buy a house. Yeah. Um, and the home builders are being a lot more uh, conservative on the amount of supply that they have. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's not that easy to get a loan. Let's 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 be uh, um, some stats I heard this morning. The average FICO score for mortgages today is 750. That that was astounding to me. That's yeah. that's that's really really good credit. We've got um, in 2006, coming into 2008, we had 13 plus million mortgages that basically didn't have any equity, and had um, adjustable rate mortgages. 10 million of those were going to reset during the crisis, which is one of the reasons why we had the crisis. Sure. Today, we've got something like two and a half million of adjustable rate mortgages. Of that, two, two and a half to three, you've got roughly 1.4, 1.5 of those are about to reset. On top of that, high focus, FICO scores. On top of that, um, lots of equity in the home. Lots of equity. Something like over 11 trillion when you just back out 20% down payment on a home. And you, even if you've owned a home, say you take out an 80% mortgage if you're refinancing, there's 11 trillion dollars there. Wow. It's hard to get a loan from a bank. If you've tried, it's not that easy underwriting standards have shored up banks used to lend like crazy the loan to deposit ratio which is the amount of loans they put out there on their balance sheet that they lend versus the deposits they have our checking accounts was 130 percent and the banks had very small equity overall their total asset base five percent now those equity values the equity cushion at banks is eight to ten percent the loan to value is 70 percent so it's negative 30 and now it's eight to ten you're saying is that I, I well it, yeah they loaned 30 percent more than their deposit base right. but that you know banks historically lend around 90 to 110 yeah. 130 was a little high 70s low but why are they doing that one they've been burned before two they have uh, a lot of reserves that have that they're sitting on right the, the 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 fed makes them keep park these reserves and those reserves are held in treasuries short-term treasuries well fed raises rates and guess what happens? The money that the banks are earning from those reserves that the Fed has to pay them is going up. Mm-hmm. And at least until this point, we could talk about it some other podcast about changing regimes. But mm-hmm. what what are we what are we looking at? A bank is saying, okay, I can make a loan that may default on me at five percent, or I can lend to the government at three mm-hmm. and risk free. I'm just going to sit there. Yeah. And so the banks are not the banks of old so which I did want to kind of get in and maybe give a little bit of historical background of my history um, because I've been through through some of these markets a few crashes so 2000 I was on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange I was a uh, specialist broker I helped the specialist so if you wanted to buy IBM there was only one place to buy it there was no ECNs out there electronic uh, trading networks you had to call up uh, a broker or you call up Credit Suisse or Schwab, and they would call up a broker. The broker would come over to the specialist and say, I want to buy 1,000 shares of IBM. One guy traded it. And then the, the clerk would be back there with his square box, and he'd be typing away, bidding $100, you know, $100 for 1,000 shares. Yeah. And you'd be in there, and I can't tell you how many mistakes I made. And it's, I have a good story for that, but well, that's, another, <laughs> that's another day. Fat fingers. Uh, fat fingered one, and it went right across the tape, and everybody looked. It was like, you know, it was but anyway, um, it happened once, and uh, 
uh, but anyway, so AOL, Time Warner had a a weird merger. Yeah, I remember. AOL that. was a buggy whip kind of company, right? Other people's money selling copper. When uh, you know the equivalent fiber optic company AOL was the wave of the future, they went out there and they acquired them basically. And well, in in the blow up in 2000, that merger blew up, and it wasn't a quiet crazy blow up people typing in in their uh computers through schwab and making trades the the specialist is sitting there and there are 100 brokers around him screaming sell they have to hold the book put all the orders together i mean it was chaos and i had just you know gotten the floor and i'd only been there a few months yeah it's like march it was of shocking. 2000 yeah yeah it was it was shocking and right. anyway so that was kind of scary uh and i remember there was a book uh, dow had hit 10,000 and then it crashed but um there was a book that said Dow Jones thirty six thousand. I remember at the time thinking that is crazy. Well, just a while ago we were over forty. Yeah. So don't it bet on the happen. end of the world. Right. Exactly. Fast forward two thousand eight. Well, was, you, you skipped. Oh, uh, I, I skipped nine eleven. That was a good one. Uh, I was working across the same firm, but I was working on a proprietary trading desk upstairs. My desk shook, and I thought it was a boiler blew, and I saw this paper flying through the air, in the window, and they had a lot of ticker tape parades at the bottom of Wall Street. I didn't think anything of it. Then I looked at CNBC and saw a plane in the window, uh, had flown into the, into the, uh, Twin Towers. to the Twin Towers. And I had just read a book on um, the Taliban. I don't know why. A friend of mine gave me a book on the Mossad. I thought it was really interesting. Then I went in this rabbit hole. I started reading up on the Taliban. And, and all of a sudden, like, I was plugged in. I knew what was happening. I knew it wasn't just some plane. Wow. I knew it was a terrorist attack. My boss, who was a billionaire, grabbed me by the shirt and said, what's happening? I remember saying, it's a terrorist attack. we got to get out of the building. They locked everybody in the New York Stock Exchange. That Dick Grasso, who was the chairman at the time, wouldn't let people out. And I took off. And I ran over to South Street Seaport. I was on my way, and I felt guilty because nobody was following me. I went right back up. I go, we've got to leave now. Anyway, 9-11 was absolutely terrible. Uh, they actually closed the market. You know, when we have these holidays, they never close the NYSE for more than three days, including weekends. Yeah. So. So if it's July 4th and it's a Thursday, somehow they're going to find a way like, okay, you're going to get your holiday on Thursday, but the market will be open Friday. It's right. got to be open. At, it can't be closed more than three days. Well, they closed that for five days or something. Yeah. And we talk about sell corrections. Orders sell orders, up. crazy. But yeah. you know what? One a area that was going that way was any defense company. Yeah. So people are selling stocks like crazy. They don't want to be part of it. They don't want to fly again. It's changing behaviors. People are talking about, I'll never fly again. Yeah. I don't want to own stocks. Security companies are going crazy. So mm -hmm. there's always some pocket of the markets going up. Anyway, that was scary. But again, my point is it's completely different than what happened in 2000. 2008, you kind of saw stuff building. You knew it was going to be bad. You knew that there were crummy mortgages. You knew these credit default swaps. There's some great movies out there. Uh, what was the Adam McKay movie? Do you remember that one? No. Oh, anyway, it was a fantastic movie. Um, anyway, so that one was really scary, but that was a banking crisis along the lines of what I told you about. Banks were not well capitalized. They were greedy. They were making bad loans, and that blew up. And that was almost the end of the world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it And it wasn't, but... And then after that, what do we have? Some quantitative easing. Then we tried a couple taperings. It didn't work. Then we had COVID, and that was kind of scary. And so I guess my point is, and you always say, what is your point, Jeff? And my, po <laughs> my, my point is. No, I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> my point is I've been through a bunch of crises. They're all different. Yeah. And in some respects, they're all the same. We get overly pessimistic and really fearful. Yeah. And we get through them. Yeah. We do get through them. And what's happening right now, I think, Quite frankly, we're deep into a correction right now. I'm of the mind, and know people don't want to hear that, but I was like, let's just get this over with. If we're going to have a recession, let's have a recession. If we're going to get to some normal interest rate, let's get there. Mm -hmm. If we're going to get the likes of the FANG stocks to normal multiples, let's get there. Because you know what? When they were so elevated, the expected returns for the next 10 years, like, oh, great, I made all this money for five years. You know what that means? The next 10 are going to be anemic returns. So now we dial it back, we have a recession or we have this correction because of all the reasons we talked about. Everything comes down, but the expected returns are gonna be that much better, yeah. right? That doesn't mean it's over. It right. doesn't mean it can't go lower. Um, and people ask, where's the bottom? When are we at a bottom? Well, to me, de facto, when you know it's in the rear view mirror, you don't know yeah, until yeah. you're 
out from it. But what do you do in the meantime, right? Hopefully you have an advisor. Hopefully you don't panic. Hopefully you can take the longer term and just get away from the noise, you know? You're walking through the forest, you see tree, 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 but if you get above it in a balloon, you look, oh, that's a forest. I mean, some, you just gotta have a bigger perspective. Yeah. And so what are, what are two things that I think we can take away from the markets and just people in general? Because um, there's all kinds of things going on and all these crises are different and they all have different catalysts and they all have different reactions, but there's two things that I think, and we talk about this a lot. One, um, humans are emotional and we get a little too euphoric and we get a little too pessimistic. Mm. And that's the time where you can make money or you can really lose money. You can lose money by panicking and saying, I can't take any more, I can't take another 10%, I gotta get out. And then you have that decision. I may, I have to make two decisions. One, I got out, and when do I get back in? Some of it's like, oh wait, you know, it goes, it goes up and you're like, I need a correction. Um, I don't want to admit I'm wrong. I'm going to sit in cash and you miss out on that big return. And time in the market is way more important than time in the market. And then what's the second thing? And we talk about this when I started working with you. We've talk, we have a view of the world, mm -hmm. right? And we're in the midst of a, an amazing technological revolution. Regardless of what's happened to those companies, they got ahead of themselves. New industries, it's pretty hard to imagine what they're actually worth. So people say, oh God, it's worth infinity and I'm gonna buy them to infinity, the valuation and yeah. interest rates are low, that's what I'm gonna buy. But, and then it changes now. It's like, I don't wanna own that, I don't wanna own that. Oh, God, don't talk to me about that name. Or then you know you're getting close to a bottom. I'm not saying we're there. Yeah, and but why don't you want to own it? Cause I've lost money, right. it's down. That is the worst answer. Right. And that's- uh, Why do I wanna buy it? Cause it's gone up. Right. <laughs> the other worst answer. We said it last podcast, know what you own, right? Yeah. Um, and also, you own it. Right. And know who you are as an investor. You say you can take volatility. Well, here we are. We're in the midst of volatility. I mean, I, I don't enjoy it. Don't think for yeah. a second, because we're talking about it, that it's fun. It isn't. I think it's good to say that, right? Because it keeps me up at night. Yeah. It really does. Mm -hmm. um, but what's the second thing? Humans are emotional. So there are, be aware of that. Doesn't mean that we don't feel it, but let's not act on those emotions. Right. And then secondly, corporate America. It's a profit-driven society. It's capitalism. Whether capitalism is going to exist in 50 years from now, I don't know. But right now, companies will continue to grow. Companies will continue to innovate. Companies will continue to disrupt. And companies will grow profits. And when you own a basket of these things, the ones that don't work out, you know why they didn't work out? Because you own the ones that disrupted them. And over time, it's this, and you're gonna be okay, but you just can't, you know, it's like a drop of pebble in a pond. You can't look at the, you go out out, out in those ripples and it, subs, it starts to make, it's a little calmer out there and you start yeah. to understand things. You're like, okay, this is fine. This is what we signed up for. We know this happens. I'm not gonna panic. Hopefully our advisor is paying attention. Yeah, <laughs> and no, uh, I, I think that's a really good point. I mean, it just kind of, it's a great, great several analogies that you made, but in, in practice, you know, when we're, when we're doing these projections in our client's financial plan and we're looking at asset allocations and potential future rebalances and you go out 10, 15, 20 years and, you know, if somebody's retiring, they're 60 years old, they, they're not saying, show me the projections until I'm 72 and then I'm good. You know, I'm like, right. I want to know how much money I have when I'm 90, 95, like it's a long time, 30 right. years. How many recessions are we going to see? How many bear markets are we going to see? How many market crashes? You know, how many wars, how many, I mean, and, uh, tight, tightening and easing and, and recessions and inflation and deflation. I mean, we're just in it for the long run and it, it is a, it is a long-term, long-term battle. Yeah. And so, okay, I'm not going to live my life looking nine months in front of me and spending the next 30 years worrying about the next nine months. It's just a horrible way to live your life in my opinion. Right. And so if I can have some of my portfolio, a very small amount, I actually care about what happens in the next nine months. A little bit more, I care about what happens in the next two to three years. Majority of it, I really don't care what happens to it for the next 10 or 15. And so how would I think about that? So I think if investors can look at the different parts of their portfolio and something we try to do is say, hey, this is your long term, this is your mid term, this is your short term, and take right. a look at those lens to see you know, how much worry you have. And so when we do those reviews with clients, obviously they, they, there's not a lot of worry, right? Right. I mean, but there's still worry. I, I don't wanna undercut you know, the significance of watching the S&P drop by more than 20% and the NASDAQ going down by more than 30. I mean, it sucks. It's not fun. No. 
Uh, and recessions suck, and they're not fun. And nope. everybody makes less money. Yep. And if you have inflation on top of it, and you know you're you're watching costs go up, and you're making less, and your margin, you know that extra amount of cash flow or investment or discretionary spending is gone. It sucks. Yeah. But they don't last very long. And so I think investors need to know that. And that's why I'm, I'm with you 100%. Let's get it over, right? Because we know that once we're there, you're not going to stay there long. And you know what's on the other side of it. And so it's right. like, can we just do it? So, okay, you know, here's the wall of worry. It's happening. And yeah. we can kind of see it. And I think it's really important for investors. And this is something that, you know, over all of those big dramatic events that you mentioned, the tech wreck in 2000, um, really, I mean, 9-11, 2008, 2020, you know, and we had S&P downgrade in, in 2011. That was a big deal. We had that London whale, you know, we had all kinds of things where the market actually shorted out, right? And Which, by the way, trading. I forgot those things. Those, Yeah, I forgot about Remember the London whale that was? and the S&P downgrade of our, and of the stock our market sovereign market shut debt. down. Yeah. I mean, how often does that happen? And that was crazy at the time, and I've already forgotten it. I'm in the industry. Because you go back and you look at that tape, and you're like, oh, it's a bull market. No, <laughs> everyone, you know what the headlines look like? They look like this. Yeah. The world was ending, and that didn't stop for a very long time, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. I mean, my whole career, everyone's just like, the whole world's going to end. Well, And if you listen to that noise, gosh, did you miss out, and did you irreparably make decisions that just caused you to live a worse life? We need time magazine subscription because they're the ultimate contrarian indicator i think it was 2009 they came out with the death of housing it was the bottom close right. to the bottom i mean it, it bled a little bit lower but time magazine and jim kramer that's yep. when you <laughs> <laughs> exactly Those are the, do the opposite do the opposite yeah I, yeah that's good but so my point in all of that is okay so i mean one listening to the show is saying look jeff dustin you're sitting here talking about we're going into a recession and you're telling me to be long term, like what sense does that make? And so here's where there's this dislocation. There's the stock market, which is which is pricing companies that make money, and not how much money they're making today, how much money they're making in the future. Right. And so let's talk about what's happening right now. Um, we're not, you know, in a recession or maybe getting close, but just. You know, going back, looking at over the last six months, you've seen we've gone down majorly on indices, right? Mm -hmm. Not to mention if you bought all the meme stocks and growth stocks, you're down 90%. Oh, uh, if you were diversified and you're in just, you know, the indexes, maybe you're down um, 20 to 30. You have some fixed income in there. Maybe you're down 10 to 20, right? I mean, it's not great, but that's on the back of, you know, consumer spending being super high real estate going up after a massive bull run in the stock market, record low mortgage interest rates, right. low credit debt, high FICO scores, m maximum full employment. I mean, employment numbers like crazy, 3.6% unemployment, wages have gone up significantly. Everyone's making money. People are buying cars left and right. I mean, s travel spent all this discretionary spending, restaurants. So, you look at all of that and you say, well, things look really good. I mean, everyone's doing good, but the stock market's down 20 to 30%. It's like, yeah, remember that. Because when things are really bad, that's when usually the stock market is going to go the other way. Right. Okay. No crystal ball, of course. There's unknown, unknown events like 9 11, right? And, and so, you know, that, that exacerbated things, right? Unknown things like COVID, you know, that exacerbated. They exacerbated things, but you know you go through a recession, and so you know the market is going down before the economy is because yeah. it's that discounting machine. And so, okay, did we just see that happen? Did we all just see that happen? Yes, we're all nodding our heads. Yeah. Yes, we all just saw that happen. So now I understand. I know it. I know it. I have a known understanding of how there's a dislocation between what the economy is doing and what the stock market is doing. And if it happens on this way down, oh, I get how it could be the inverse. How when the economy goes into a recession, the stock market says, I know what's next, right? Right. And so when people are asking, when's the bottom, waiting for the bottom, and that's where you're like, ah, let's just get it over with. We might be there, right? We might be, we might be close, we might not, we might need a little bit more time, but we know it's coming and we know it's on the other side of this. Right. 
Well said. And so I think that's why, you know, when investors are like, why wouldn't you just get me out? It's like, well, it's the worst thing you could possibly do is sell low. Um, and, you know, if you're investing in stocks because you only care what's going to happen over the next six to nine months, don't invest in stocks. And maybe some people just should never invest in stocks. If you can educate yourself, understand and get prepared for a long term game, and know how to make how to avoid making the absolute worst wrong choice. Turn off CNBC, right, or your your app, stock market app, you know, or, or read a different article, right? Go out and take a walk and enjoy the air, and um, it's okay. You know, we're gonna get through this. So, I think that's just another thing that we wanna we wanna get out there. And remember, another thing too is fear sells. Yeah. Yep. Right there, that that gets attention and. You've got to do the things you've just mentioned, and, and we're all emotional, but it's understanding when you're in a uh, an emotional period and, and, and knowing how to act like that. I don't care who it is. They say that some of the best investors are anti-emotional. I just think they just don't make emotional decisions. Mm -hmm. They they know. They're in control of their emotions. I mean, and, and look, we're going to make emotional decisions, and I mean, I think a lot of that is, you know, I don't know whether it's emotional, but kind of how we're saying talking yourself into a recession, right? It's based on a feeling that you have about your overall financial stability and capacity and whether you're going to spend or travel and, you know, be more conservative on your spending or, or whatnot. So that's kind of a based on a feeling, right, right, that you're having about things or a thought about what you think the current status is. So that's going to happen naturally. Okay, that could be good, right? That could be really good. And people do pull back their spending. Right. I mean, when we run financial plans and we do Monte Carlo t analysis and we, you know, stress test, you know, DEFCON bear market scenarios, we don't say, and that's correlated with a 20% drop in spending. Typically it is, but we don't. Right. right. We say, even you spend your way through it, you know, are you okay? Um, but I, I think just, you know, you don't give yourself the option. Like, you get to make those calls, right? You yeah. don't get to liquidate cash out. I mean, that's that's just the the worst thing to possibly do yeah something foolish <laughs> something silly something silly doing something silly so yeah i mean i think that's just the best defense i mean when when you know a lot of times in the show we're saying well what can people do and we talked about roth conversions in the past we were talking last year about people getting prepared on refinancing this is your this is your chance we told everybody hey this is your chance not, might not happen again for a long time maybe never Right. Not in your lifetime, right? And that's a very real possibility, people adjusting to this new normal. Um, but, yeah, just uh, the advice, what can you do? It's what you should not do right now is what I think is really important, right? Absolutely. And, and, and we'll get through this just like you have in your whole career. And I think um, I was not going to say get to the point because, for me, <laughs> it was bringing me a lot of assurance uh, listening to you, going through all of those, and how scary all of those events were at the time, and you being as close to them, I'm sure they were even ulcer-inducing scary. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, But yeah, we do get through them. And yep. there's there's opportunities abroad when we get there, you know. And so we'll see what happens on the other side. But you know, you you know, you you can think in your own portfolio things that you shared with me about those companies you're able to acquire in 2009, 10, and 11. Um, you know, what, what opportunities we get during these recessions. The other thing I just mentioned about recessions is how long have we been going? 40 minutes. 40 minutes? <sighs> long episode today, Jeff. Well, we could talk about it uh, on another podcast. We'll talk about recessions and why they are ultimately good for your long-term investment portfolio. I might have an analogy or two for you. Okay. Well, why don't you save it? Because I think uh, I think that's good. I don't think we're going to run out of time to talk about the recession in the next two weeks. So no. we'll bring back bring that back. But um, anyway, we are here for you as always. If you need a sounding board or a review, Jeff and Dustin here at Presidio and all of our team members here at Presidio are here to help however we can. Um, but thank you for tuning in. Thank you for subscribing to our YouTube channel or listening to us on Spotify, Apple Play, wherever you get your podcast please like share let people know tell them about the procedural perspective and uh wealth of knowledge that we have from this gentleman across from me and our perspective giving it to you so thanks so much have a good one we'll see you next time take care